So we can see already that shooting 3D, stereoscopic 3D, isn't as straightforward as shooting 2D. It is technically more challenging. But don't be afraid, don't be worried. I probably made it sound a lot worse than it really is. Once you understand the principles and the way this all works and interacts, it's really not that hard, especially once you know a few rules of thumbs and guidelines that you can follow that will make your life a lot easier. But there are other issues and other things we need to consider as well as screen size when we're shooting uh, stereoscopic production. And one of those issues is that our brain doesn't instantly fuse those left and right images together, combine them inside our head into a stereoscopic view of the world. It does take a little bit of time to happen. And if those images, as I said before, are not correctly aligned, that can take longer, takes more brain power, and that leads to fatigue, tiredness, stress, nausea, and other things. Other issues that cause us problems is one of the things called retinal rivalry. What's retinal rivalry? Well, that's very simply when one eye sees something that the other eye doesn't see. For imag imagine one of those glitter balls in a disco that rotates around. Each of the tiny mirrors on that glitter ball is creating an individual shaft of light. And as that shaft of light crosses your eyes, one eye sees it before the other. And exactly the same thing would happen with a 3D camera. One beam of light, one reflection off a mirror ball, maybe off water or something like that, may be going into one lens but not the other. And that creates a conflict in our minds when one eye is seeing something that the other eye doesn't see because normally we don't see that. Normally both eyes pretty much see the same things at the same time. So that's one thing we do need to be aware of, look out for and avoid wherever we can. Other issues we have with a stereoscopic production um, is one of them is because we now have a sense of depth in our scene we have to be sure that our focal length matches that sense of depth. If there is a mismatch between the focal length and the perceived depth in the image, strange things happen. If you perceive the image as being very, very deep, but everything's quite magnified or quite large, then faces can become stretched and people's noses become longer and their faces no longer look round. Generally speaking, with a stereoscopic production, you need to use focal lengths that mimic the way we see. So you're looking at, uh, if you're using a super 35 millimeter camcorder, focal lengths between 20 millimeters and 35 millimeters, very common focal lengths. Once you start going beyond 50 millimeters, things become more telephoto than our own vision, and it becomes harder and harder to make the depth realistic. You have to start using very narrow interaxials uh, in many cases to try and make things look natural but then you run into problems with cardboarding and everything else. So there are trade-offs to be had with focal lengths very often and what you can actually do. And one of the other issues you have with a stereoscopic production is one with scale. Because we now have a sense of depth to our scene that we're seeing in our 3D film, if the size of objects isn't correct relative to the viewpoint of the viewer, things will either look larger or smaller than they should be. Um, very often it can, you can very easily look like you are a giant, the viewer is a giant, looking down on a miniaturized view of the world. A really good example of the scale issue is this one. Now this is a picture of a jumbo jet. Now, I assume that we've all seen a jumbo jet, so we know how big a jumbo jet is. If we look at this picture now, I'm quite sure that most of you would agree that this is a picture of a real aeroplane, not a toy or anything, but a genuine, real, full-size jumbo jet. Now, if we look at this stereoscopically, when the jumbo jet is behind the screen, our brain treats the screen uh, a little bit like a window. It relates to looking out of a window. So it treats the jumbo jet as being outside of the room, outside of the screen or outside of the window, off in the distance. And that's fine. We're very tolerant of scale when something is in that type of situation where it's outside of the room. And it still looks like a real jumbo jet.
but we have a real problem if we now try and bring that jumbo jet off the screen into the cinema space, into the foreground, into that negative disparity. Because now there's a real conflict going on. Because I know, you know, the viewers know that a jumbo jet won't fit inside most cinemas or most living rooms. And your brain knows this. So your brain perceives this jumbo jet that's flying around in front of your television set or in front of the cinema screen as a toy because it knows it can't be a real jumbo jet inside a living room or inside a cinema. So we have to be very careful with how we use scale and in particular how we bring objects into the cinema, into the living room. And this is more of a problem with productions for television than it is for the cinema. Obviously a cinema is generally a very large environment with a large screen. So you can have some pretty big objects in the foreground coming into the cinema space. But try and do that with a television set, a much smaller screen, and it will be much more of an issue. So we need to be aware of this and we need to be considering this when we're planning our production. Another issue that we have with stereoscopic productions is what goes on at the edge of the screen. Again, our brain is treating this screen that we're looking at a little bit like a window. If you try and bring something into the foreground, right at the edge of that window, it just doesn't work because actually the point of view is incorrect. Because when we look out of a window, we actually see if this is the window frame, we actually see around out into the edge of that window and this eye sees further around the window than this eye. But when you try and bring something into the foreground in front of the edge of the screen, actually what happens is the reverse. And this eye is not seeing um, as much as it should see. So the object looks very strange. It doesn't really, especially it's right at the edge of the screen, look truly three-dimensional. And your brain will be very confused by this and what your brain tries to do is to actually pin those uh, front of screen objects at the very edge of the screen to the screen edge or to the frame of the TV and it does spoil the illusion of depth at those edges. So you have to be very careful trying to bring anything into the foreground at the edges of the screen. There is a technique that you can use to mitigate this. It's called a floating window. Um, I don't have time to go into this here in this presentation um, in any depth, but basically you manipulate the edges of the image and you create an artificial stereoscopic edge to the screen, which can help mitigate um, issues with edge of screen objects. Okay, I think that's enough of the, the downsides of trying to produce a stereoscopic production. Let's actually start to look at the practicalities of how you would shoot in 3D. Well, you have various options on the camera front. You have one-piece cameras with two lenses, uh, two fixed lenses, or you have 3D rigs. Uh, you could have a 3D rig like the Hurricane rig here. Um, at the moment, this is configured as what's known as a beam splitter rig. And we have two cameras here on the rig. The light is coming in to this mirror box here. And in this mirror, we have a 50-50 mirror. So half of the light is going through to this camera here. And the other half of the light is reflected down into this camera here. And why do we do this? Well, if we look into the mirror box here, let me just make a very small adjustment. And if we look into the mirror box, we can actually just about see our two lenses are actually currently overlapping. With a beam splitter like this, you can actually bring the separation of the cameras down effectively to zero. So you can have uh, interaxial of zero. And with the hurricane rig in this configuration, you go from zero to 120 millimeters. Now the other configuration you can have with the hurricane rig is side by side, a little bit like this. And in the side by side configuration with the hurricane rig, the cameras go from typically around 120 millimeters, dependent on the size of the cameras and how physically, how close you can get them, um, up to about 350 millimeters. So you have a very broad range of camera lens separations. And this is really important that we can vary our camera lens separation. Because if you remember to earlier 
in the video we mentioned disparity and how disparity, the difference between the left and right image, is governed by the interaxial, the interaxial being the separation between the centres of the camera lenses. So when we're trying to ensure that our on-screen disparity doesn't exceed that 65 millimetres or 65 millimetres plus 1% so that our viewers' eyes are not looking apart, we may, for some shots, need to use some very, very narrow interaction. We may need our lenses very close together. For many productions, 30 millimetres is a very common camera separation. Now, if you have a fixed lens camcorder, one of the issues there is you can't change that interaxial. So your disparity limits are governed, they are, they're set in stone by those fixed lenses. So that means that a twin lens camcorder can only be used for certain types of shots. Now let me introduce a rule of thumb here. This is the 30 times rule. And this rule says that the closest you can bring an object to your 3D camera or 3D rig is 30 times the interaxial. So that's 30 times the distance between the centres of the lenses. So if my lenses were, for example, 100 millimetres apart, I can't realistically shoot anything closer to the cameras than 3 metres because I will end up with excessive disparity, giving the eye look apart problem potentially, on my viewing screen. Now this 30 times rule actually stems from digital, actually stems from still photography, creating anaglyph type images and things like that for use in print magazines. And that would have been on an A4 sized piece of paper. When you scale that up to cinema size screens, you'll actually find that a more realistic figure is actually closer to 100 times. So if my cameras were 100 millimetres apart and my interaxial was 100 millimetres, I couldn't shoot anything closer than 10 metres to the cameras because I would just have too much disparity. And one thing to consider is that includes the ground. So if the ground is coming into your shot more closer than 3 metres in the case of a 100 millimetre interaxial, you're going to have a problem with excessive disparity. So we can see from this 30 times rule that there'll be many cases where we need to use interaxials smaller than 65 millimetres. For example, a scene where you have something in the foreground, maybe a table with a vase and a flower on it and your actors are behind that table. You may need to bring the interaxial down to 30 millimetres or even 20 millimetres if the foreground uh, is going to be very close to the cameras. We can also see from this 30 times rule that if we're going to shoot something that's a long way away from the cameras, we may need to have a very wide interaxial. If you remember right back to the beginning of the videos, I said that we as human beings don't actually see things stereoscopically beyond about 30 meters or so. So if we want to make a video uh, featuring panoramas, cityscapes, landscapes, things like that, then we may need much wider interaxials possibly uh, 200 millimetres, and that's where a side-by-side -side rig would be used. Um, I've used the Hurricane rig for many uh, applications, cityscapes, uh, mountain panoramas in Iceland, uh, shots of geysers, uh, and things like that, and it's very useful to be able to have that wide separation. So we can see that even though a one-piece camcorder may seem to be very convenient, very easy to use, that a beam splitter rig or a side-by-side -side rig, or a rig that does both, like the Hurricane rig, is going to be much more versatile and will do many, many more shots than any single one-piece camcorder can ever hope to do. Now, the other thing that happens when you change the interaxial, change the separation between the lenses, is it changes the amount of on-screen depth, as we mentioned earlier. The interaxial governs your depth volume or how deep your shots appear to be. So by having a 3D rig where you can change that interaxial very easily and very quickly, we can tailor the depth volume for your video, for your program, from scene to scene, from shot to shot. 
because one of the things that you don't really want is to be cutting from shot to shot and having big changes in your depth volume. Perhaps one shot is a series of close-ups, the next shot may be a panorama, and if the depth volume is jumping about all over the place, that can make it very hard for the viewer to watch the program. So again, a 3D rig becomes a very valuable tool, allowing you to change your depth volume from shot to shot.